Hi there, thank you for clicking on my discussion blog for this week. In response to the first question, what's the most common reasons for a board to discipline a counselor and what are my reactions as I read through the list? Uh, the most common reasons, according to Wilkinson et al. 2019, I found an article uh, regarding a study that was purposed to explore trends in the violations of counselors and this is a direct quote from the source. It says, the most frequent types of ethical violations included failure to acquire the appropriate amount of continuing education, dual relationships, sexual and non-sexual, and, non and misrepresentation of credentials. As I was looking through the Virginia Board of Counseling's website, um, I'm in the state of Virginia, I found several cases that dealt particularly with dual relationships, both sexual and non-sexual. And it was just a common theme um, my reaction to this, it's sad. Um, I am grateful that we are aware of when it happens so that discipline can be enacted, but it is sad to see it happen. Um, so someone that's stepping into this role, I want to do everything possible to lessen the likelihood of this happening. Uh, some themes that I see when I'm looking at the common reasons for board discipline, um, any violation of the ACA code of ethics or of the state codes requires discipline. I want to discuss a specific case that I had found on the Virginia Board of Counseling website. So there was this qualified mental health professional trainer who was counseling a client who divulged that he was going through some traumatic um, things and he was experiencing anxiety and depression and eventually they wound up in a dual relationship, both romantic and sexual. So this is a direct violation of one of the codes from the ACA Code of Ethics, specifically A5A, um, which prohibits any sexual or romantic relationships in the therapeutic alliance. Um, I also believe that she violated C2G, which uh, discusses impairment. I'll talk about this later. But as for the state codes that were violated, um, since I'm in the state of Virginia, the specific codes that were violated were 18 VAC 115-80-90, and the second one was 18 VAC 115-80-100, 3, 4, 6, and 7. Um, the next question, uh, what was the behavior that led to the discipline? She engaged in a sexual relationship with her client. The outcome, uh, her license was suspended indefinitely, which is very sad, but there's the repercussions of the violation of the Code of Ethics and the State Code. So what does the ACA Code of Ethics and their state and your State Code say about counselor impairment? So specifically from the ACA Code of Ethics 2014, this is a paraphrase, but impairment, it talked about two parts. The first part talks about counselors having the ability and they should monitor themselves uh, on a level of wellness. And if they feel that they are becoming impaired in any way, they should seek help, whether that be from colleagues or whether that be uh, in counseling. The second half of that discusses calling out uh, other individuals so that could be colleagues or that could be supervisors if uh, an individual sees another person who seems to be impaired. The reason why that calling out happens is to protect the clients from being harmed from the counselor that is potentially impaired. Um, as for state codes, state codes fall along the same continuum. It discusses just the safety of the individual and any violation of that is going to have repercussions as we've seen in the case that I've discussed with you today. What question does this bring to mind for me? Um, it just seems like a very common thing, dual relationships. Um, and it makes me sad. I wonder like, how does this happen so easily? It makes me think that the counseling setting is such an intimate thing. Um, it makes sense why it happens, but as counselors, we need to be on guard and prevent this from happening. So thank you for listening to me today. Have a good night.